Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. I'm delighted to introduce you to my personal uh, anti-aging expert and doctor, the man that I have on speed dial, Dr. Joseph Hakeek. Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. Good morning, Baha. So good to see you. So good to see you. We see each other a lot. I feel like I spend a lot of time in the clinic uh, for all what I call my tweakments. And this is, after all, your specialty. You have a reputation for making women look like themselves only better and for longer. Well, you know, it has always been my philosophy from day one is not to change any face, just to improve it. Um, we all are beautiful. I think every face is beautiful. And, and our job as physician is it's really to actually change what the aging process has caused. Uh, or in some instances where people have not been gifted with a special feature, but not to really go to town and, and make someone unrecognizable. Do you get freaked out when you see the homogenization of facial features because someone or a group of people see a fad on social media or a celebrity and want to transpose that exact look onto their own faces? Yeah, look, absolutely, Bahar. Um, I think it comes down to two things. Is I, I mean, sometimes I wonder whether or not there is a lack of skills. And what I mean by that, not lack of skills of really doing procedures. Everyone can do a technique, can do a procedure, but the skills and really discovering what is aesthetically beautiful on a face. And I think this is where uh, I, I sometimes feel that, you know, if you're dealing with a scientist, pure scientist, they're not really tapping into that part of their brain where they can actually step back and see what is beautiful, what is a beautiful human face, and not really trying to create the same thing again and again on totally different faces. I remember once stepping out um, in Houston, in um, Texas, I was on a business trip and walking around in the shopping center and walking around in the streets, I was shocked by how similar everyone looked. And it was as though all of the women in this city were frozen in time, but not in a beautiful way. So all their efforts to look ageless had actually aged them. Do you see that um, in your you know, line of work I, as a cosmetic physician? I, absolutely, absolutely. And I remember many years ago, the one of the magazines had sent me a series of celebrity that have had some work done. And then a the question they were asking, why are they looking older? And, and, and that, that's, that brings you to the point that you make and really you need to remain ageless. And to be able to remain ageless, you need to respect that face and only do what that face really needs and not to do the same procedures again and again on different people. Because for instance, in someone in their twenties, if you really make the cheeks very high, you can create this very gaunt look that sometimes mimics what woman looks like when they're 50. So if you're 20 and you, you do this procedure on a 20 year old face, you are gonna look older, not younger even though you might end up with higher cheekbone, that doesn't suit that face, let me add, you, you will look older. So yeah, absolutely. I think the trick is to design a procedure to suit each face that you, you see every day and not to actually go on a roll of creating the same things like a factory setting where you repeat the same process again and again on every person that you see. So you, you brought up in your 20s, and I'm actually going to ask you to take us through what you feel is an appropriate treatment plan at each stage of your uh, facial aging. So let's start in our 20s. What are, I, I mean, God knows we're getting more and more women and men in their 20s having quite um, intense cosmetic procedures. But what do you recommend are the first tweakments that we can start investing in in our 20s? Look, I mean, if you know me well, and I'm sure you know me very well, you know that skincare is very important to me at all stages, but more so at your 20s and then even before the 20s, because especially living in Australia, we have a hole in the ozone layer. So we get a lot more sun damage than our European friends. So in your, in your teens and your 20s, to me, it's all about the skin. So you need to start to, first, first product that I'll always say is not negotiable in my practice is sunscreen. We need to wear sunscreen every single day. 
The second ingredient that I like Australian more so than the, than the rest of the world to wear is antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E. All these products will help to scavenge the free radical from the sun and then pollution. So to protect our skin that little bit extra. But also in, my twen in the 20s, I, I, I'd encourage some patients to start to use vitamin A or retinol because retinol is, is really a very good anti-aging product that we can utilize this force, if you like, of skincare product to try to keep us looking the same until we get to our 30s. What you notice physically on the face of 20s and in some, some patients, you will notice that the glabella frown line or the line between the eyebrows, they will start to become more uh, obvious. And that's probably because we're spending more time looking, you know, I adore looking at the sun, we're squinting, we're looking at screen. So, so this is one area that often you start to notice in your 20s. The second area that we also notice is the, the hollow under the eye, or what we call the tea trough. Uh, hollowing under the eyes that create, start to create that beginning of the dark circle that we might see later in 30s and, and 40s. But the, the, these are the two main areas that will probably require an injectable treatment uh, to try to prevent the aging process. Now, put that aside, there's some people in their 20s that have not been gifted, for instance, with a high cheekbone or a prominent chin, or they might have a bump on their nose or might have a, a, a very tiny upper lip compared to the bottom lip. Now, I would not say no to those uh, people to actually enhance their beauty, but each case uh, has to be analyzed or really, uh, if you like, uh, looked at, at individually. And, and then, so this is where you are at 20s. The biggest, biggest item is really skincare. Now, if we go from skincare and trying to evolve a little bit more into, into this field, some of the treatment that we can provide for someone who's already established some skin damage or they've been exposed to the sun or get a few sunburns when they're in their 12 and 13, 14. By the time they get to 20, they're gonna start to show some sun damage effect onto their skin. So for these clients, I would highly recommend that we'll do every four to six weeks a medifacial or a facial where we combine um, light chemical peels to their skin, just to stimulate their skin to produce better, better collagen, better elastin, resurface the skin, minimize the pore, pretty much all the seven signs of aging that we can face uh, uh, throughout all our life, we can start to target them with a very, a very simple solution. A very, a, these days, peels that really don't have the same downtime that we used to have when I started 22 years ago, where people used to go and hide for seven to 14 days. I'm gonna ask you, a lot of people, talk about having injectables which you touched on in your 20s as a preventative measure now injectables fall under two categories or possibly three um tox which is to paralyze the muscles filler to fill and build up um loss of uh, i guess volume and then uh, boosters um what are your thoughts about injectables in your 20s for those three particular treatment protocols? Okay, I, I, will, I will answer that question for you, Baha, but let me just uh, clarify one thing. In my eyes and at All Saints Clinic philosophy, Tox is not a product that we use to paralyze the muscle as you would have experienced having been a client of All Saints Clinic. So for me, uh, Botox is a muscle relaxant and we use it in baby doses to relax the muscle so we can allow the eye to open up. If you, if you freeze all the muscles around the eyes, you're gonna look the same except you look frozen. And to me, this is not beautiful. Beauty is when you can actually open someone's eyes, lift the brow to actually give them that really beautiful uh, you know, shape to the eye where you can allow the light to come from the side and hit the eyelashes and you, your eye will sparkle. So this is, this is, I just wanted to make that clear that you know, in my right. eyes, Botox is not a freezer. It's a muscle relaxer and you need to use it very strategically. So when people say to you, Botox is easy, no, it's not. It's, it's a very complex procedure that you need to actually understand what effect you want to achieve in seven days. So you can't see the results straight away. So you almost need to have the experience to understand where every drop you put on someone's face, what effect it's gonna create in seven days. And, and so as long as we understand that, I'm happy to answer the other question. Um, I don't believe that Botox should be used from you know, 16, 17 uh, and onward as a preventative. I, in my eyes, I think you know, prevention is sunscreen, it's really your skincare. If you wanna actually treat things that are existing on your face like a frown line or you have horizontal forehead line in some patients and they're actually bothering them, yes, by all means, we can treat them. 
but to treat everyone that walks into your practice with just a bigger doses of Botox um, as a preventative, it is wrong because all you're doing, if you're freezing that muscle, you're causing that muscle to deteriorate and to disappear. And then you're going to end up needing more filler. So as you see, I'm not thinking about me here. I'm thinking about my clients. I mean, it's so easy for anyone to give people big doses of Botox and then bring them back two, three years later and then give them more filler because we've created this problem. So no, we need to actually educate the people out there that be wise, be smart, and think through every procedure that is recommended to you. Think about the consequences, think about the benefit, and make an informed decision about what is right for you. So no, Botox is not a preventative. It's hard to make these informed decisions because there are not very many places to get the informed information. And that's kind of what, one of the reasons I launched Ageless. I've been in the beauty industry for about 20 years, 12 years as a publisher and editor. And the questions that I get most often are about the aesthetic sides of beauty and the product, you know, the cosmeceutical side of beauty. And it felt like th there's just not enough places for consumers to go to um, and often you know if you book in to see a doctor um, and that's not the case with your practice I've been coming to you for 10 years so I you know I'm spoiled but it, there often isn't time to answer all these questions so I'm really excited that to have this conversation with you as a reference guide for people so we talked about tox as a um, muscle relaxant what about mm -hmm. um, the role of filler and skin boosters which are also another form of injectable in your 20s and then i'm going to go on to the 30s and beyond sure well, let's start with the skin boosters skin boosters is, is a product made from hyaluronic acid that is in some instances not crosslink or crosslink slightly to um to hydrate your skin and, and as you know, hyaluronic acid is the biggest factor while we have water in our skin. It locks water in our skin. So if you're already suffering from dry skin or your skin's a bit dull uh, because of many different factors, including pollution and smoking and, and you, you name it, there's a lot of factors that can make your skin really feel dull and terrible. Um, skin boosters are good and they're good for everyone at any age because all they're doing, they're adding the, um, the reservoir of hyaluronic acid into your skin. So your skin is always dewy, plump your pore size are minimized. So to me, this is a no brainer. I think everyone will benefit from a skin booster of some sort. And there's many different brands on the market. We're not gonna go through them all because we'll be here all day. Um, as far as filler, I'm in the philosophy that you only change what needs to be changed. And this is where it comes to the decision to the doctor or the esthetician together with the client to make this decision about what's gonna work for their faces. I think where people are going wrong is they see something on Instagram, on social media, and they say, oh, that looks pretty on that face. I would like to have the same. But you must understand is not everything that is pretty outside uh, on Instagram is gonna look good on your face because unless it makes sense and elevate your beauty to another level, there's really no need for you to have it. And then if you sit with me in the office, you, you'll, you'll see that I say more no's that I say yes to my clients when they come to see me. And the reason why is I want everyone to look beautiful. I want everyone to look flawless, but it doesn't mean that they need to have all the procedures that we have. So in your thirties, tell us about the aging process and what we can start to see um, and, and then the ways that we can potentially treat these um, aging that you can start to see in your thirties. Well, Definitely in your 30s, you're going to see progression of what you started to see in your 20s. So your skin quality is going to deteriorate slightly. You're going to show more signs of the sun damage. You're going to have more wrinkles. The dark circle under the eyes are going to start to become a little bit bigger. The nasolabial folds or these folds that happen here, they start to become more obvious. And that's purely because you start to lose volume from all over your face. Let me, let me stop you for a minute. When you see something happening to your face and you see some sign of aging and loss of volume, it's happening all over your face. You only see it in the areas that really present themselves first. So you see the consequences of volume loss. You don't actually lose volume only from this area. You lose it from all over the face. But this is, as a human being, we tend to focus on one thing. And then often we focus on this nasal labial fold, we focus on the T trough, or we focus on these areas. But in your 30s, you're already starting to lose some volume. And in some patients, you'll certainly notice that the nasal labial fold has already started to appear. And some other patient, you notice that in the cheek, the cheek areas start to become slightly flatter. And in some other patients, you start to notice that the front area here starts to create a bigger groove uh, in this zone. 
So volume loss starts to occur more so in your 30s than it was in your 20s. Um, and then also the elasticity of your skin will start to deteriorate slightly, not in a big way, like what happens in your 50s, but will start the process to start to occur. And we actually, science have taught us that even in your 20s, especially in Australia, you start to lose elasticity. Like you're not aware of it because you have such a huge amount of collagen and elastin in your skin that we're not so aware of it. You talk about collagen and it's such a huge buzzword at the moment. People are doing collagen induction therapies with procedures, but also taking supplements in collagen. Are, the, are our 30s the time that we really need to talk about and think about collagen? Uh, yes, Baha. I think this is the time when you start to notice it. It doesn't mean it hasn't occurred or happened already, but this is the time that if you're serious about the aging process, that you should really stop and take a look at your face and see if does it really matter to you if you if you don't have any elasticity in your skin or it doesn't. And then you make a decision, I'm gonna go on this journey and I'm gonna try to resurrect what has, has been lost. And so definitely 30 is the time that you need to be serious about it because especially for women, when you head to 40s and 50, and then because of menopause, which we'll talk about briefly later, um, you're gonna have more consequences to your skin. So back to our 30s, and um, you you noted the things that are going, we're going to start seeing manifest in our skin. Um, mm -hmm. are, are there areas of the body as well? Um, you said because it's it's happening all over your face, not just under your eyes, not just in your nasal labial fold. What about the rest of our body? What are, what is the deterioration that the aging process is going to start manifesting in your 30s? Well, I guess it depends on how much of a sun lover you are and how much of a, a non-sunscreen lover you are. Uh, it depends on how, how what happened to your face and body, really. It's just all to do basically utilizing protection uh, throughout your whole life if, if you want to protect your skin. Uh, your skin is a living organ like anything else uh, with us. And, and so when people... Um, uh, when, when people are actually just looking at their face, look at their neck, look at their chest, look at their hands, because these are the areas that are getting as much sun exposure as you face and are often neglected when we put our sunscreen or when we put our skincare in the morning. So to me, as you face the neck and chest and hand is part of your face. So whatever you do to your face, you do to all the, the four areas. I know that you launched um, Le Petit Saint, which is your skincare atelier um, opposite your Double Bay Clinic in Sydney, Australia. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I think is really amazing is that you have such a um, huge uh, selection of sunscreen products as part of your cosmeceutical skincare offering. And when I go in there, um, your practitioners mm -hmm. always say to me, have you got something for your neck? Have you got something for your hands? Have you got something for your knees? Have you got something for your chest? And it's made me think, you know, to when I do my skincare routine, what am I doing for those areas? And, you know, I'm in my 40s, so it's not prevention so much as it is cure. But I now tell my daughter, who's 10, when, when she's applying sunscreen, I say, you know what, darling, don't forget to do the backs of your hand. Don't forget to do your chest anywhere the sun hits. So I really like um, what you're saying there about, um, you know, the body, it, it depends on how much exposure that you're getting. Um, Going back to the concept of collagen induction, what are the roles mm -hmm. of um, ultrasound therapy and um, uh, other, you know, minimally invasive treatments that we can have in our thirties to make to boost skin elasticity? Well, there's many different technologies that exist, and as you see, there's a, a big interest from people out there for collagen induction therapy. So you can start with things like needling. Needling is a very good example of collagen induction therapy, and it was the, the derma roller, which was, uh, I, in fact, I remember launching for one of the companies in Sydney maybe 15 years ago now, was one of the very first devices that was put on the market to uh, encourage collagen uh, stimulation or induction. And then of course we followed with the uh, derma pen. Um, Can you explain what the derma roller and the derma pen is for people who don't know what those two particular devices do and are? Well, derma roller is a little device that had a little wheel at the bottom of it. And at this wheel, there's very tiny needles. And then what we used to do is used to take the derma roller and roll it on the skin. 
So you, you know, the, as it rolls, the needle penetrates. And the, the key point with the needling is not to actually cause a lot of trauma. I've seen a lot of people use it aggressively. It's not necessary. And what necessary is, is actually to tease the cell for the cell to think a trauma is coming their way. So the body will respond by making healing uh, juices in your skin. And as part of these healing juices, you get a lot of collagen. And this is how we trick the body to do it. So going very rough with the derma roller or the needling or the derma pen, which a derma pen is as electric. And then so the needle go up and down very quickly. But as you move it on your skin, the needle will go in and out, in and out. And that will also do the same thing. But again, it's just all about being gentle with it, not to be aggressive. You don't need to see those photos of lots of blood like Kim Kardashian did on one of the posts. I think that's just pushing it to the other extreme. And in some cases that can, can cause problem for a certain skin type. Um, and so this is one technology which is really needling. Uh, as far as the ultrasound treatment, you can use things like our therapy. Our therapy is also a good technology. It's non-invasive. And then with our therapy, what I like about our therapy is that you can visualize what we're treating. So it's not a blind treatment. So you can adjust the depth of where you're causing the injury or microthermal injuries so your body can contract and respond by making collagen. So you can see at what layer we're doing the treatment. And some of the other technology, you're not aware of where you're, where, where you're putting the injuries in the skin. So you could be causing harm or you could be missing the target and not causing anything, or you could be by accident hitting the target. So it's, it's, it's a, leaving it by chance. And um, um, so that ultrasound therapy, what exactly are you doing? And is it suitable in your 30s? It's something that you would do in your 30s? Again, it's, look, it's suitable for all people, all skin type, because ultrasound does not target color. Uh, it's, so it's suitable for all skin type. What's, with, with ultrasound, what you're doing, when you, most people know ultrasound if they've had a um, injury or if they've been pregnant, we use ultrasound to take pictures where the, where the rays go outside and take a picture of something on the outside. What we do with medicine, as far as the skin, uh, skin health is concerned, we reverse the angle. So instead of going that way, the, the light is going this way. So it comes to a very, very firm point. And that point is almost like when you just take a magnifying glass and then you're trying to con concentrate the sun through that magnifying glass where it goes on the other side to a very pinpoint spot. And that pinpoint spot will be so hot that sometimes you can start a fire with. So with ultrasound therapy, we're doing exactly this, but we focus in that pinpoint to a microscopic point at a certain depth in the skin to heat the old collagen. And by heating the old collagen and the surrounding area, the cells that make new collagen are stimulated. So you're heating these cells to actually become active again. And then when they're active, they're gonna make much more collagen than they were meant to be in the first place. So this is how you can treat nature in working for you. So that's kind of, instead of using something like filler, which is a foreign um, substance, you can use your own body to start reproducing its own collagen. Um, what about, um, you mentioned Kim Kardashian and uh, yes. you know the treatment that she had was called the vampire facial, which is PRP. What is PRP and um, do you recommend it? And when, when would it be a good uh, treatment to have? Again, P PRP is, is uh, I mean, there was one thing that's called PRP and there's one thing that's called a vampire facial. And I think out there in the community, the whole language has been confused. PRP by itself is when you take someone's blood, so you take blood from the arm, you, you spin the blood so you can separate the platelet, and that's what I call PRP or platelet-rich plasma. So you take this platelet from the, from the body, you activate them in the tube through uh, another solution where based on calcium. And so when you activate this platelet, you open them up. So you release all these growth factors, the hormone, all the good juices that exist in our blood for healing and for repair. And then you re-inject them back into the skin. So you concentrate in this, uh, I call them juices because they're, they're gonna make something good for your skin. So you inject them back into the skin at the, at the dermal level so they can, make your skin fresher, younger, dewier, and then does everything that you want it to do. And so this is what PRP. Um, and then some, some people refer that as the vampire facial. Some people refer to derm dermal, uh, the needling as derma facial. I'm, I'm, it's all confusing really, but it's like, let's go to science instead of the marketing names. So it's PRP is protein rich plasma. And then you have the needling. And sometime when you're doing needling, you can take the blood and put it on the skin and do the needling uh, at the same time. So this way you push in the blood 
through the derma pen versus you injecting it with a syringe into your skin. And what is the role of a microdermabrasion in all of this? Because I, I love the conversation that we're having because it's giving people so many options. You know, if you don't want to have anything injected into you that's not yours, there are options. If you don't want to have anything invasive, you can have, you know, light or uh, ultrasound. But what about the role of dermabrasion? Microdermabrasion is still one of the most searched um, terms in, um, you know, skincare and anti-aging regimen. Do you, do you believe in it? Look, uh, I used to. I used to do a lot of microdermabrasion 22 years ago, and then I used to do it myself because 22 years ago, we did not have dermal therapists. We did not have beautician working in a, in a clinic. So as a doctor, I, were, I used to perform the, the microdermabrasion. I used to perform all the peels. And so back in those days, that was the, one of the first technologies that we had, and we were all excited about it because we're starting new. But knowing what I know today and knowing the, uh, the pros and cons of microdermabrasion, I don't offer that as a solution in my practice. I prefer to go with something more like hydrofacial where you, you're not actually abrading the skin in a dry environment. You're, you're abrading the skin with a wet environment where it's a gentle on the skin. You're not causing issues. Some people with microdermabrasion can get, hyper, can, can get hyperpigmentation. If your skin type three and above and they go rough with the microdermabrasion on your skin, and I'm sure you've, you've heard of seen friends that have had, had these stripes after microdermabrasion where sometimes it could take weeks for that to go away. So I'm not a huge fan of dry microdermabrasion. I know people still offer it and, and they might have a reason why. I don't see that reason. Um, so that's fantastic. And the hydrofacial I've experienced myself, and um, there is a massive difference between a dry microdermabrasion and, and a wet, um, you know, exfoliation. And, and I found that when I was having hydrofacials, actually at your clinic, um, I could have it more often. And I, it, it worked really well for my skin, for the texture, for the pore size, and also mm -hmm. just the health of my skin. It, it's a it's a great treatment. And again, something that's non-invasive. So, and you could, you know, potentially do it often if you don't uh, want to have anything injected into your skin or anything um, that's invasive. Let's talk about aging in our forties. Um, I met you um, just after I turned 40 and um, I've had a great anti-aging journey with you and your clinic. Tell us what are the major signs of aging that we're going to start noticing in our 40s and what can be what kind of treatments you suggest can be done well we've already touched on really the collagen and elastin this is when you're going to start to notice that in a much bigger way than what we have seen in the 30s and so because of that and then because of the continuous aging process to the fatty layer and the muscles and then some of the bony layer as well, you're going to start that is to notice that your face is deflating. So you're starting to see grooves in your, in your face. Sometimes it's in the middle of the cheek. Sometimes it's in here. You're going to see that this circle around your eyes is almost starting to become a full circle. You're going to notice that in some people, the marionette zone starts to become more obvious. Now, again, as I said, this is what we notice, but it doesn't mean it's only being lost from this area. And, and I'll, I'll talk to you a bit more later about the liquid facelift and why I've designed the liquid facelift with the technique that I, I've, I've come up with. Um, it's, it's, so in your, in your 40s, you're going to notice this volume loss and you're going to notice that your face is becoming flatter. And as your face becomes flatter, your skin's going to drop because of the elasticity loss and, and the collagen loss, you start to drop. So the shape of your face start to even become uh, different. You become more squarer as a woman. Um, now, uh, as a little side, men also go through the same thing at a slower rate and they become even squarer. But we accept men to be more handsome if they have a square face. So they kind of, they, they live in a high life in their forties because they look in their best, really they've looked uh, throughout, throughout the years. But as far as women is concerned, uh, as your face becomes square, we really don't like it. We don't appreciate it because historically we didn't really say, oh, a square face on a woman is beautiful. Maybe if we, if, if history, if we repeat history and say a square face on a woman is beautiful, we would accept that this is really the way to go. But unfortunately, a, a beautiful woman face is always accepted as being oval or round, but not a square. So women will start to notice their faces starting to widen in here because as it drops, it lands in here and then you become in the same area that we call jowl, you start to become heavy. 
And so, so this is the things that you can notice. And sometimes when you look at people without even knowing their age, viscerally, you can tell where someone is. You can tell someone is their 20s, 30s, 40s, because of all this. And you don't have to be a doctor to actually be able to tell that, because I'm sure if you look at anyone in society and say, oh, she must be 40 or she must be 50, because of all these signs that we as human, we can interpret and we can give it, give it uh, a, a number, if you like, 40, 50. Um, so I find that it's in your 40s that the idea of being ageless first starts manifesting in your consciousness because a lot of times you feel young and you're living a really active lifestyle. You. Can you I've hear lost me that. Now? Can you hear me no, now? Can you know. Yes, oh, okay. yes, yes, yes. Um, I feel like the, in your 40s is a time uh, where you are really manifesting this concept of wanting to be ageless. You feel young, you have a lot of vitality, but perhaps your face and your body is letting you down, you know, 40s is typically a time after you've had um, your children. Um, and yes. you said that you're going to talk about uh, hormones and perimenopause and menopause. So 40s is usually a time for perimenopause. And yes. then um, you, exactly as you said, intuitively, when you meet people, even in a first scan, you're able to kind of tell how old a woman is once she reaches her 40s, not so much in her 30s. So um, you touched on the areas where you can see the aging and it's uh, around this area. So what are some of the things that you advocate uh, in, uh, in and alongside great skincare, which you should be seriously investing of in? Of course. So I'd say whatever we start with 20s, we continue and we change the formulas for people according to their age and to where their skin is. But in their 40s, and, and, and then we need to talk about that maybe a bit later as it's about hormonal changes and, and perimenopause or menopause for some people. But where, where the key issue is, is volume loss. So this is will be number one. I can give you facials from now until next year. If I don't address your volume loss, you're gonna look the same and your skin will not respond. It's, it's really a misnomer in the community to think that, oh, I can do facials and that's all I'm gonna do and I'm gonna get results. You can't. You can't because science had really proven that you can't. So just relying on skincare alone or on just facials, it's not going to give us any solution. If your house, if the roof of your house is starting to collapse and you need to check the columns, if the columns of that house is really steady and, and strong, yes, go and fix the roof. But if, you're, if your columns of the house are really wobbly, you got to fix those columns before you can address the roof. So for me, the skin is the roof of the house. So now we need to look at the foundation. How is this foundation? Is, is, the, is the face has got enough bony, bony volume? Have you gone through menopause? And you, because because of menopause, you lose a lot of bone. Uh, and then also you, you, you lose some of the fat, you lose some of the uh, muscle uh, strength. So you need to address all these three layers of the aging process before you can address the skin properly. So this is when I start to have this serious conversation about volumization with the filler. Now, dermal fillers are not a foreign substance. They're uh, substances made from hyaluronic acid to match exactly the same thing that our face does have or our body have. It's, it's in our eyes, it's in the joint, in the skin, and it's the same whether or not you're human or animal or plant, it's the same molecule. So it's a very natural molecule, but what we do in the laboratory, we cross-link it so it becomes like a chain of spaghetti. Uh, your body can break down one molecule at a time, but it cannot break the whole chain. And this is why a filler can sometimes last three months or six months or nine months. It depends on how long this chain is. So in, in our 40s, this is when we need to have that serious conversation about rebuilding your face if you've already lost it. And if this is the first time you're coming to see us, we need to actually have that serious conversation about what you have you lost and let's try to replenish it, but replenish it in a very natural way. So you'd look like you and it doesn't look like you just had uh, uh, 10 mils of filler. In, in your face or in the wrong places of your face. So you need to understand the aging process. And that's not the same between two people. You could be both in your 40s, but you both will age differently. And, and it's our job, and that's what we do at All Saints Clinic, is our job to understand this aging process and how it affects you personally and trying to address it for you and not for your friend. It doesn't matter what your friend has had. It doesn't matter if they had their cheekbone or their chin. We need to look at your face and see how much you've lost and replace it with that same amount that you, we, we estimate that you've lost. Um, I know that one of the things that we looked at for me this year, and I was so surprised to have this treatment with you, is that you filled my temple area and you put 
uh, Botox just in this um, part of my chin, just below my lip. What what's that all about? Okay, so again, in your case, you uh, I see people aging in two. If I put two two big, big categories, you either age from the ans outside inside, or you age from the inside outside. This is how I classify the aging process just to sort of guide me personally. And so by that, I mean, people start to lose volume from the outside of their face first, and it shifts to the center, or in some people, they lose it from the center of the face, and then they start to move it for, to the outside. In your case, Baha, what I've noticed is that you're losing that fat pad that usually support the face on the outside. So what I've noticed is the temple is starting to become hollow. You lost a little bit of the height of the cheek from here, and you were starting to lose a little bit of volume from the outside. And so this is why I address this area for you, because I'm only replacing what nature is trying to take away from you. It's just this, this battle between me and nature the whole time, you see. And what, what is the role of exercise and weight loss? You've said to me before, stop losing weight. We won't be able to keep up with, you know, filler. Or um, I can see that, you know, you, you've <clears throat> lost some structure. Um, can, can your body actually metabolize filler faster if you're exercising too much or losing weight too quickly yes. well when you exercise you increase your metabolism so you increase everything to do with metabolism so whether or not it's the fat because when you exercise you're trying to burn away fat from your body but you, your face is part of your body so you're going to lose some of the fat in your face now also exercising increases your metabolism which means you break down the filler a lot faster whether or not it's a filler or it's the botox or it's anything that you really have on board, you're going to break it down a lot faster if you have a fast metabolism. And this is why I think people that exercise uh, strenuously, they will need to come back more often to top up their, their treatment versus someone that actually doesn't do much at all. Um, in staying on topic of in your 40s, um, I know that, you know, just um, neck laxity starts to kind of be an issue. And one of the things that we've talked about um, in terms of my treatment plan um, is threads. Um, and mm -hmm. I'd like you to share with me your thoughts on the role of threads as another way of um, inducing collagen and where it would fit in an overall treatment plan in your 40s, 50s or beyond? Sure. So before uh, before we actually resort to the threads and someone who's got an issue with the elasticity of the skin, we have other solution that we can jump on first. And, and the number one will be something like Fraxel, Fraxel fractionated laser resurfacing, where we take away the cells, the old cells, and allow your body to replace them with the newer cells. And we do that uh, as, as the word says, fractionally. So you're not targeting 100% of the surface of your skin. You take about 20 to 30% of the skin in column. And this column is vertical. It's almost like you go in a column of cells that disappears and then your body replaces it. The second product that we can resort to is something like a Radies or Sculptra. And these products are injected into the skin to stimulate more collagen and elastin. Radies is the only product that we know of that stimulates elastin in the skin. Uh, and proven by science. So this product is really important because it, it, it's gonna bring back some um, springiness to your skin. So we do these things always first. Of course, we are, and I, without having to say skincare, all that is still the same, nothing really changes. But then if you're still needing more of a lift or more uh, a stimulation through collagen, you can use either the PDO threads, which is a short thread, the very tiny thread that you've probably seen on social media, they're pink usually in color. And then we put them there to stimulate collagen. So these, these are the, the thread that stimulate collagen, no different to sculpture or to, to red ES. But then you have the lifting threads where you put the threads to lift an area of your face upward uh, or to the side. It depends on what it is you're trying to do. So it, it's a slightly more complex than, than, than um, to, to explain in a couple of words. And it usually we just need to have a look at each individual and decide what's going to work best for them, what suits their lifestyle and what suits their skin. And what can you do in terms of under the chin area? I know that uh, for men in their 40s, this is like a real hot spot, but also for women. Um, is there any non-invasive treatments that you can offer in a, as a cosmetic physician before resorting to surgery for under the chin area? Of course. Now, before we address the chin, you always got to address the face because remember, as you lose volume from your face, everything's going to sag and it's going to accumulate in here. So step number one, you fix the face. 
Step number two is as you ensure that your jawline and your chin has got the right volume because as you put volume in the chin, you push the skin of the neck upwards. So this is, this is the easy solution where you can target the face, fix the face and fix the neck indirectly. So once we've done that, if we still have concern for the neck, we resort to the same thing I mentioned previously, a Sculptra, Radius, the PDO threads where they stimulate collagen. And in some instances, it's really the threads that we can put to lift the neck off, off, the, uh, off the skin of the neck to, to the side. I lost my earbud. <laughs> <laughs> Is it worth doing these in your 40s or can you leave this until you're in your 50s? No, I always say the minute you notice a skin elasticity concern, you start the journey because remember what I said, things don't just happen overnight. They happen slowly. So if you're noticing elasticity loss somewhere, it's happening everywhere as well. You just haven't really paid enough attention to see it. And if we had a little machine that we can go and put it on the skin and measure the elasticity uh, loss, which someone should really invent for us, we can prove that to people that, hey, it's already happening to you. Um, uh, so, so I would say if you're concerned about a particular area or if you have it in the family history, I'd say start young. Don't, don't wait till you're 60s to actually start addressing it. One of the things that you have really transformed in my journey is brightness of my skin and skin evenness. And, and definitely I'm using great skincare, but uh, we've talked a lot about, I used to use hydroquinone on my face to, to bleach out um, melasma that I had. But now I've had, you know, mini laser treatments with you. Um, the hydrofacials have been fantastic also for me. Light therapy. What are some of the things that you offer as a cosmetic physician and you recommend for pigmentation on the face and on the body? Uh, again, in addition to skincare, and I still use hydroquinone for individuals that require hydroquinone use because sometimes it's resistant. Uh, I'd start with a very light laser, like a Simply Brilliant or Permea, which is specifically designed for uh, pigmentation and melasma. I've uh, had these the are clear and Brilliant. Yeah, it's great. That, that's right. So it's like a baby Fraxel, really. It's actually designed by the same company as Fraxel. And, and they're both really designed to resurface your skin, but very gently. When you have pigmentation, you need to thread very carefully. Being aggressive can cause more pigmentation as some people would have experienced. So you need to design a journey very gently. It's just the way you walk very lightly on it. So simply brilliant, um, sorry, clear and brilliant, permea, and then you can go up the scale for some Fraxel for the people that can uh, handle Fraxel. Uh, when I say handle their skin, uh, skin type, uh, skin Fitzpatrick type can actually is suitable for Fraxel. We go on to Fraxel. One of the beautiful solutions that I personally, uh, I, 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 I have one every year is BBL or broadband light or IPL. Some people refer to it as intense false light. And IPL is, is beautiful treatment. Uh, it's got multiple benefits, including treating pigmentation. It's a superficial treatment for pigmentation. So it will pretty much peel the pigmentation away for a year at a time. Uh, while Fraxel will go much deeper. So actually trying to remove the bulk of these pigmentation. But um, BBL is non-invasive. You can do it in the office and then you can go home and the way you have brown will become slightly darker for a few days and flake off and leave your skin beautifully flawless. Uh, and, and in one color, so there's not many colors, so whether it's redness or brown, it cleans it beautifully. Um, as, as well as that, I mean, we do have also uh, very invasive lasers uh, that we keep it for people that have acne scar and with pigmentation as well, uh, something like the erbium laser. So we, we do have other serious technology for individual cases that are going to be resistant to the non-invasive one, if you like. Um, one of the things that I had, I think it was about three years ago, and I'm due to have it again. I loved it. It was the best I, I honestly credit it as being the best anti-aging treatment of all time is you put filler in my hands and I have not stopped raving about this treatment. It is a game changer. Um, tell us about how aging occurs in your hands um, and some of the things that you can do. I think you, you, uh, anyone that listening will see there's a repetition. There's a theme that repeats again and again. We lose volume everywhere, right? And then a hand is another area where we lose volume. Normally in your 20s, you have lots of fat on your hand. But this fat, as part of the aging process, also start to disappear slowly, slowly. And as it disappears, you start to see structures underneath 
where the fat is located, no different to the face. But also the hands are the areas that we've often neglected. We end the sun, we use uh, chemical substances, we don't moisturize, we don't uh, put sunscreen. So the, the skin is changing very quickly, but also the structures underneath the skin is also changing. So replacing the volume uh, with a, a hyaluronic acid solution or with um, polylactic acid or with even red ES, uh, where you can replace the volume, but also create more collagen, more elastin, can really rejuvenate your hand beautifully. And you only need to do it once a year because the results can last a year to a year and a half. So Mine has lasted for years. My, my yes, hands have lasted for years and I love it. I, I You know, it removes some of that veininess. Um, correct, correct. It definitely look, made my, you know, made my hands look as old as I felt. So I, I love that yeah. treatment. Look, I just, I don't know, for some reason, this, this vision came into my mind. The aging process is like really just going in a field where there's a lot of snow. And when you're in your 20s, there's a lot of snow everywhere. When you get to your 50s and 60s, the snow is melting away and you can discover all these things underneath it. And these things are the bone and the muscles and everything else and, but, you know, underneath it. So this is really what's happening. The snow is melting and you can see all these hidden structures underneath it. So let's go to our 50s. What are some of the things that have, you know, if we haven't been on a treatment journey and we're just, you know, entering our treatment journey, what are some of the things that you really start noticing and what are the things that you're treating and how? Um, one thing I forgot to mention about the 40s and the 50s is that the uh, RF micro needling where you utilize, it's a needling procedure, but it's a micro needling. And I've had that procedure myself and I love the results that I actually created. At 55, I think I'm doing quite good as far as my jawline and, and definition. And that's, you know, uh, it's just called RF micro needling. And this is, this is the ultimate of the needling procedures where you uh, not only doing a needling procedure, but you're introducing the heat at the same level as you wanna do a facelift. And so these, these micro drops of heat contract the collagen and tighten the face and stimulate more collagen and elastin for the next year of after the procedure. So this is, we need to keep that amount also for the people in their thirties, forties, fifties, and so on and so forth. And you can repeat it once a year very safely. In some patients, I've even recommended three sessions a month apart to try and really um, up the ante as far as the loss of elasticity is concerned. And your fifties, this is when you're seriously starting to notice uh, volume loss. And, and, and more than anything, especially if you've gone through menopause, you are gonna notice some bony loss. Now, we all know about menopause and then osteoporosis. Now, again, remember, the face is part of your body. So if it's happening to your body, it's happening to your face. But we also, science have taught us that the, the, the skeleton will remodel because of hormonal changes. So the opening of the eye become bigger. So the eye will fall more inside. So when people feel like their eyes are getting sunken or their eyes are getting smaller, uh, it's, it's actually not their imagination. It's actually, it's a, anatomical changes that happen to the face. The bone of the cheek start to flatten. The opening where the nose is also widens. So the nose drops down a bit. And then when you look at these pictures of people in their eighties, and when you see that the nose has dropped too much and their chin's gone up, because you're also losing bone from the jawline, everything's really remodeling. And in some people it's quite severe and some people it's not noticeable. And so this is why it's important to assess each patient. It's a scary, it's a scary journey if you think about it in that, in that, in that, um, in that theme, because we are losing the structure. We're losing the columns that really supported our face all these years and we're losing it much faster now. And this is when you see our people in their eighties and nineties, you see that their face become very tiny. It's because of the bony remodeling and bony remodeling is real. And it's part of the aging process. And that's really, it doesn't matter if you lived a good life or a bad life, it's part of your genetic and it's part of what, what happened to us or men or women really. Do you work with cosmetic surgeons and um, dentists <clears throat> when you're working you know, with an overall rejuvenation plan? It seems that there are so many elements happening. Uh, do, you, do you guys work in concert? Like I, I know in the US, when they're performing a facelift, for example, there's a cosmetic dentist, there's a cosmetic physician, there's a whole team that will group together to give the optimal result. And celebrities don't turn out, you know, 
like the most gorgeous selves without a team of people who look after them. Correct, correct. Look, I, I do, uh, and and, and I'm, I'm one of those doctors that I don't try to do everything myself. If I see someone that has a, a condition that we don't treat at All Saints Clinic, I do refer to um, uh, various doctors around me in Sydney and some of them in the States. Uh, and I had sent some people to doctors in the state that they offer a solution that we don't have in Australia. Um, and that was many years ago. Now, I think we, we pretty much, Australia has advanced a lot, so we have everything uh, at home. Um, so yes, I do, and I do refer. And I think in some cases, people can come to you, and then if the skin elasticity is far too gone, the only solution is going to be is just to actually lift. So either, whether it's a facelift or a neck lift. Uh, have, I, have I treated people that were on the border and then got good results? Yes, I have. So it is possible to rescue someone, but it depends on how much uh, energy and money they need to invest into this journey. I want to talk about your famous liquid facelift. We've talked about it before on Rescue, but I want you to talk us through it because it seems that the 50s, that pre-surgical consideration is a really good time to consider a liquid facelift. Um, tell us what it is and who it's for. Uh, the liquid, liquid facelift is a procedure where I've really thought about many years ago because as a sculptor, I just thought it as a sculpting exercise. And so I look at a face and I see what is missing from that face. And I come up with a plan of, of areas that need to be addressed. And these areas is what constitute the uh, bulk of my liquid facelift. So this is where I use filler across the full face, starting from the forehead all the way to the chin. But I'll also use anti-wrinkle injection like Botox or Xeomin or Dysport to um, lift the face. So I can use the Botox to open the eyes by lifting the eyebrows. I can soften some of these lines. But in here, again, I'm not looking for a solution to freeze any muscle because a frozen muscle is no use to me. I can't lift the frozen muscle. I need movement. And so I use the anti-wrinkle to open the face and I use the filler to plump up the areas and create a nice, beautiful structure and definition. And then I use uh, lasers or uh, skin solutions that we have at the practice to resurface the skin or to create a beautiful um, platform whereby all the features can really arise from. Uh, and then of course, complement that with skincare to maintain the results for a year at a time. And so it's a solution where I'm utilizing pretty much all our skills in one visit or could be done over many visits. It doesn't have to be done in one visit, to be honest. It could be, could be split over four or five or six visits. It could be done in one month. It could be done over a year. Um, we designed a liquid facelift for the individual to set their lifestyle, their budget, um, to, to whatever really works for people. It's not really just a, a cookie cutting uh, mechanism that we do at All Saints uh, anyway, but it's just a procedure designed for the individual to improve their face and take them back in time. So with the liquid facelift, probably the 50s um, is where, you know, it, it's most appropriate. And you said that it will last about a year. Um, so would you recommend that you would do the liquid facelift and then incorporate some of the other treatments that you mentioned in addition to a liquid facelift as part of your plan so that you avoid going under the scalpel? When you say other treatment, you're referring to laser treatment and then skin laser, treatment. PRP, microneedling. Yeah. Um, I usually patient. I usually design all that at the at the initial session because at the initial session you know what the skin is like. And in some instances, you know that just putting the filler in an area is not going to lift it. So you need the skin to be firmer. So the whole journey is, is conceptualized at the initial uh, visit and then discuss with the clients. And, and this way we can plan for it because some of the procedures cannot be done at the same time as dermal filler and some could. So we can talk about the journey, if you like, and then we just go on this journey together. Well, I could speak to you forever, but I've got one other thing that always gets asked. And I know that this is an area of specialty for you. What can we do with the eye area, um, you know, in the same vein as you do the liquid facelift? Is there, a, mm -hmm. is there a way that we can do a non-surgical eye lift using uh, the skills of a cosmetic physician, lasers, injectables, fillers? Yeah, absolutely, Bahar. Um, an eye opening procedure is one of my favorite because um, you know when, you, when you've been doing uh, dermal fillers for 20 years, like I have, you always wanna think outside the box and trying to come up with new solutions. 
So what you can do for the eyes, apart from using the alpha L therapy or the uh, RF microneedling, where you can tighten the skin around the, the eyes, you can put Botox in the upper face, so the forehead, the frown, and the eyes in a certain way to make the eye open up. So you can actually create this lift by relaxing portions of different muscles. So you're almost like a puppetry. You're trying to get some muscle to work while other muscles to, to sleep. And then you're trying to push and pull in the direction that you want the muscle to push or pull. And so this is the first step. The second step, you can use, use dermal fillers around the eyes. There's many solutions that are suitable for around the eyes. So you can, the common one that people know about is the filler under the eye for the tea drop. So to stop the dark circle. But we also will put filler in the temple, like you've experienced, that actually cause a little bit of a lateral lift. You can also put filler underneath the brow, pretty much on the, on the, on the, uh, on the bone to support the skin. So when, the, when you do the Botox and you lift the skin, it's got somewhere to sit on. You also can put filler in this zone. This is all danger zone of the face. And this is why uh, you, you probably find that mostly doctors and ex experienced doctors are using these procedures because this is the dangerous part of the nose, no different to the, uh, to the nose and to even to this area, which is the danger zone. So we can Could utilize- Could you just explain what it is? If someone's listening and not watching the video, the danger zones, just go through them so we can hear you say what the so, danger zones are. Look, the face, the face is a dangerous zone, a full stop, but there are even more dangerous zone on the face that you need to be wary of. And this is where there's an artery, the facial artery travels come from the neck and travels on the side of the nasal area fold by the side of the nose, and it goes up towards the, uh, for, uh, to the hair, but it also goes towards the eye. And so any of these arteries or vein need to be respected and not occluded. And this is when you hear about vascular occlusion. So when you're injecting around these areas, especially around the eye, you need to be careful not to put the filler inside a blood vessel and not recognize it because it's the, the issue is when you, when you cause the problem and don't recognize it or acknowledge it and send the people home with an occluded vessel, there's no blood going to this area. It's no different to a heart attack where the heart is not getting blood. You have a heart attack. If your vessels on your face is occluded and you don't address it, you keep the vessel blocked, your skin's gonna get a, what we call a heart attack. And so it's very important to recognize and these areas really, I wouldn't encourage beginners injectors to be treated. And also I would encourage people that require in this area not to go to beginners injectors. They might be good at the initial procedures that they've learned, but do not really take a chance. Yeah, go, go to a, a reputable practitioners that have been doing these danger zones for at least many years. And then if you really wanna take a chance. So, um, but yes, to go back on track, Using filler around the eyes is a possibility. And then you can put the filler to sculpt the area around the eyes to create this open eye look. Fantastic. And I just want to finish off with the, in our 60s, you, you have a lot of beautiful clients, a lot of celebrity clients, um, and a lot of, you know, family, my family, your family in their 60s that come to you to, to look and feel ageless. What are some of the treatments and procedures that you can do without going under the knife to look your best self in your 60s and beyond? And a, a lot of treatment that we can offer to our patient in their 60s. In fact, I think my eldest patient is 96 and I adore wow. her because she really cares. Uh, and she comes into me with face uh, full of makeup every time I see her. She's taken the, the opportunity to actually do the makeup for her full face to come and see me. So I, I really, I, I love that, that she really still got that uh, uh, care factor inside her. And I think that it's a lesson for all of us to actually get up and, and then look after ourselves and present ourselves well to the community rather than to be lazy. But there's all the solution that we've talked about are suitable for anyone over 50, including 60s, 70s. But more so what I tend to do for people in their uh, 60s and above is utilizing fillers that will also stimulate collagen and elastin. Things like Radius, things like Sculptra, uh, things like uh, Morpheus 8 or RF microneedling. Um, so we're utilizing solution on a regular basis to stimulate more collagen and elastin because I'm always looking for more lift as well as the sculpting. So I use the fillers I and mean, maybe the initial session could be just a sculpting session, but the second sessions after that will be all about trying to stimulate collagen, resurface their skin. So it's, it's a, this is where you get to uh, utilize all the technologies, if you like, in, in one um, 
client, but you plan it. It's not something that you de- get, get all done all in the same day. You do it slowly and over a period of you know months. That's so good to know. And I love that. I love that you have so many options. I want to wrap up with um, going back to Le Petit Saint, which is your skincare mm-hmm. atelier. It's such a... Uh, innovative step that you took as a cosmetic physician to separate to your clinic to launch um, a a space just focused on skincare because you believe in it so much. What are some of the key, um, whether you want to call brands or products that you really recommend everyone have in their toolkit, in their beauty toolkit? Um. Well, I've only taken product that I believe in uh, to Le Petit Saint and uh, even through All Saint Clinic. Um, as, you, as you know, Le Petit Saint is designed to try to be bespoke, to give each client what their skin really needs at that time of their life. And that is not set in concrete because that's going to change every three months. So it's re- really hard to actually pick product individual product that's going to really um, be suitable for everyone. It's just about getting a skin diagnosed first, find out what ingredient that skin needs and match this ingredient with a product that we have on the shelf that I believe in, that I believe that they will actually deliver the results and then trying to really match skin concern with the, uh, with the ingredient uh, via different brands. But some of the brands that I really uh, love and enjoy is uh, uh, one of them is Augustinus Bada. I love uh, SkinCeutical. I think they make beautiful, high quality, medical, great product. I love Universe Skin because it also gives you this um, ability to uh, make bespoke product and same what we can do with the, with the dose from SkinCeutical. So both of these products, you can manufacture a, in the spot in 10 minutes, you can make a product unique for that skin for the next six to uh, 12 weeks of, of their life. Um, I mean, there's many more. God, I, I can be here all day if I was to actually No, I know, I know. But I, I, I always like to know the, the what and the how. Can I ask you something? Um, and and mm-hmm. I definitely promise to wrap it up. I, we, we will come back again and again with you because you are literally the fountain of knowledge. Um, do you believe in um, taking collagen supplements and uh, beauty supplements? Do you, do you recommend it and do you believe in it? Do you think it works? Look, I, I, I think... Uh, to, to answer that quickly, yes, I do believe in it. Uh, and the reason why I believe in it is because I think our nutrition is not the same as our ancestors. What my grandmother and your grandmother used to eat was much more healthy. I think they had a lot of nutrient in their product. I think we technology has changed a lot. They can produce food for us very quickly. I'm afraid we are probably missing on some of the key ingredients. And then, so I don't think taking collagen orally is going to give you more collagen. It's just really how the ingredient inside that collagen drink that supports the, uh, your body to make better collagen or abundant amount of collagen. It's more of a supplement, really. Just a drink in collagen doesn't go immediately and sit in your skin. So this is where people sometimes think that you drink collagen and it goes straight to your skin. No, it doesn't. It's just that you're supplementing your, your body, your system to become a, a better system. So it can work for you and give you what you want, what you want it to, to, uh, to, uh, to give. Do you recommend any other supplements for, for, you know, for skin health or glow or repair? Uh, I, I do. I do. But again, it depends on each individual and then the nutritional uh, level. Someone who's really fanatic and eats a lot of good, clean food then we're not going to need as much as someone who lives in uh, on the run the whole time and rely on takeaway food and uh, you know on tin food etc. So it just depends on the individual. But yes, I do. Nutrition is very important to me as far as the skin is concerned. And what is your personal um, ageless routine? What treatments do you have? What products do you take? Uh, what biohacking techniques do you do like exercise or breathing or meditation you look amazing for 55 you have a really busy life Um, what do you do what do you do for yourself thank thank you Bahar well for me it's uh, I start my day with a really quiet zone so it doesn't matter where I am I don't have to sit down and hum to meditate. I can meditate watching a tree. I can meditate just really with a cup of coffee in my hand and watching the ocean. Uh, so to me, it's that quiet zone. It's very important for the mind and for the soul and to actually try not to think too much about a lot of stuff, just be in the moment and just really exist. 
so this is a step one for me. I, I'm a big believer in you drink a lot of fluid, a lot of water or tea. Uh, I can't ignore that I also like to drink coffee. I think to me, this is, this is one of those things that you do. You do things to, for, for joy as well. You don't do things just to suffer the whole time. Uh, you, you need to enjoy your life. So I, I do have a coffee in the morning and often I meditate with a coffee in my hand, which some people find it weird, but it just works for me. It's just like a good coffee and a quiet zone and watching nature. Uh, is, is, a, is a very important to me and keeps me grounded and it keeps me connected with everything around me. Um, as far as a skincare routine, I'm forever testing different product. Um, and some of it could be good for my skin, some of it could be not. So, but uh, I always know how to fix it. So if I use a product just because I need to know how it feels so I can talk about it and I end up with pimples on my face, I know how to correct that process very quickly. Hence why you don't often see me with bad skin because I tend to do it on a Friday and trying to fix it by Monday so I can go back to work <laughs> and looking at nothing really happened. But um, I, I have a few favorite in my, uh, in my uh, vanity and uh, uh, I mean, I'm still, uh, uh, Rational is a good product for me. I, I use a lot of universe skin product. I make my own serums and I change that from time to time. I love the Augustinus by the cream. Uh, the rich cream, I find it too rich, so I tend to use it rarely, but I, I love the Augustinus by the cream. I, I love the CE Ferulic from SkinCeutical. I think it's a fantastic antioxidant product. And look, I've got to, if I open the door to my vanity and one day, my, one day maybe I should, you can see that I have a lot of product in that vanity, but also I rotate. I don't like to use the same skincare um, for weeks and weeks and weeks. I rotate my product every six weeks because I like to challenge my skin. So challenges the skin is, is one key to keep things alive. Exercise. I, I, go, I attend a gym about uh, three to four times a week. Um, and, and often it is resistant training, so uh, that is weight. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've alternate. And sometimes I do um, Barry's boot camp. Sometimes I do yoga. Uh, sometimes I do uh, just purely running on the street. And so exercise is very important to me. Nutrition is super important. My food is very clean. I know it's boring, but it's very clean. So this way, if I do go out on once or twice a week, I can let myself out and have everything. I, uh, I don't have gluten, I don't have dairy purely because I have intolerances to it. And I think sometimes that really helped me to have a clearer skin. Um, not sure if it applies to everyone. Um, alcohol, I'm not a big drinker of alcohol. I might just have one or two glasses a week perhaps. Uh, and that's purely because my, I grew up in a family where no one really drank. So I haven't developed this habit. Um, I think the, the, the more I drank as well, my birthday party when I was 50, and I think I was with you and with a couple other friends, and I probably had about uh, six uh, vodkas, and that was probably the maximum I've ever had. I've never been drunk in my life. <laughs> oh, God. Yet. I know, yes. I know, I know. <laughs> um, can I ask you, have you had any surgery? Would you have any surgery? Uh, have you had any kind of more invasive treatments on your face or body because you know you are traveling all around the world to all these symposiums you're speaking at all these symposiums yes. you, Look, you know the best doctors I'm, I'm not a face to have surgery if i have to have surgery so i think for for the right people surgery is the right solution and I, i'm always supporting my clients if if they wanted to go down that road of having surgery i'll always support that journey because what we do need to be repeated so dermal fillers will have to be repeated. In some instances, surgery is a better solution. So I will actually I always discuss that in the initial consultation as well, because I don't want them to go on a journey that they haven't been well informed about all the other uh, alternative solutions. So as a doctor, we need to do that. And I think I encourage all the uh, uh, injectors out there or, or doctors or therapists or nurses to be open about this. It's their job to do that. And if, if, you, if your doctor is not discussing all the options with you, I say change your doctor because you need to be well informed about your life journey. Um, so, yes, I would encourage that if this is a better solution. You know, one of the things that first attracted me to the All Saints Clinic and to work with you as my ageless doctor is that your practice has multidisciplinary experts. So you look after my injectables and my overall age management plan 
but you have dermal nurses and dermal practitioners that would take care of you know, my medifacials or my skin treatments. Um, you, I've come to you for energetic um, healing and support. You've got those experts in the clinic. You've got someone who's a nutritionist and, uh, and um, you know, talks about gut health. And I think that that um, 360 degree um, treatment of um, being your most beautiful and vital self is such an important conversation to have. And um, I would like to, you know, revisit um, in, in other episodes with you, because I know that you really value the import of all those different modalities as part of your um, treatment plans Absolutely. for your clients. But for today, I, I just want to thank you so much. It was wonderful to speak to you. I love you. My skin no. loved you. <laughs> thank you, Baha. I love you too. Thank you so much for inviting me for this. And I look forward to collaborating more with you on this. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that.